Discover the Arts is brought to you by Nevada Dairymen and Dairy Council of Nevada and Estelle J. Kelsey Foundation. Hi, welcome to Art Town's Discover Watercolor via video. My name is Nancy Potterwolds Baba. And I'm Ronnie Rector. And we're going to be sharing some watercolor techniques with you so that you can have fun painting with watercolor. Hi, today I'm going to be talking about the materials we use to paint in watercolor and um, a, a little bit about color and then we're going to play with color mixing. And after I'm done, Ronnie will show you how to complete a full painting doing some really fun techniques. So we start with the watercolor palette, like this. Uh, this is a Yarka palette, but there are many others uh, that you can use. Uh, you want one that has a fair amount of paint in it so that you can use it many, many times. These are considered cool colors on the top, the, the uh, purples and greens and blues, and these are considered warm colors, the uh, reds and oranges and yellows. And a composition ideally has some of each. So we have a paint palette. We have water. And water is critical for watercolor for a number of reasons. First of all, if I go like this and I try to paint with it, nothing happens because the paint is dry. So in order to make the paint work or to activate it, as one of my friends refers to it, I have to wet the brush and then I can put the paint on. And if the paint uh, is not too wet and the paper is dry, the paint will pretty much stay where it is. Water is also good if I want to make the, this lighter. Just add water. Or if I want things to mix together and to run. If I want to add it, say, to blue. I can make the colors mix together. So water is really important for making the colors work and making the colors move. Water is also really, really important because if I'm going to go to a new color, I need to rinse my brush in between the colors, maybe pat it on the, the paper towel, and then I can go into a new color, and that color will be pure. We want the colors to be beautiful, and that means that the brushes have to be clean. It's also really important that in between colors, you don't leave the brush in the water. That's really hard on the bristles, so put it up here, or put it on the lid of your paint palette. So we have the, uh, the, the uh, colors and we have the water. We have a brush to make the, the colors go onto the paper. We also have paper towels, and the paper towel is for blotting the brush or for catching drips, which we're going to do in a minute. Um, uh, and it's also uh, good if we want to test color because sometimes we're gonna mix color and we wanna know whether that's what we want. So this is considered a color wheel. It's not every single color in the universe, of course. It doesn't have brown or black, um, and it doesn't have even magenta, although that's close. But there are three colors that are really, really important. There's a narrow by them, and those are considered primary colors because that means you can't make those colors by mixing others. And if you have only those three, and Ronnie may be doing more with that, you can make almost everything. So I put on here the primary colors. So there's yellow and red and blue. So if I mix the yellow and the red, I'm going to get this not real, real wet. Let's see what happens. We can get, well, that's a little reddish, but we can get to it a kind of orange. If we mix the yellow and the blue, we can get to a green. If we mix the red and the blue, we can get to a purple or something close to that. So we can mix the other colors. One of the things that may be evident is that there are colors across the, the color wheel from the primary colors. These are considered secondary colors. Um, and I put it on this particular diagram so you can really see. Across from yellow is purple. Across from blue is orange. Across from red is green. These are considered complementary colors or opposites. 
because there's something really fun that happens if you mix opposites, and we're going to play with this. We're going to get to kind of a grayish brown, what's sometimes called a neutral. And it may depend on how much of each you got. And you can play with this. But it's kind of fun because if you mix these together to get a brown or a black, it actually, uh, when it dries, will have those original colors shining through. So it's a little bit richer than if you just do the brown from your palette or the black from your palette. So these, these are fun ways to do things. There is a technique that we use that, to play with colors, to experience that um, firsthand. And what I did here was I took the primary colors, the yellow, the blue, and the red, and I put the colors that are next to it on the color wheel. So for the yellow, I used an orange and a green. Can you see those are next to the yellow on the color wheel? For the blue, I put a purple and a, a green and a purple. For the red, I put an orange and a purple. So that you get some things when they mix together that are brand new colors. So if we want to see what happens when we go across the color wheel and bring in the opposite or the complement, this one again started as yellow and across the color wheel from yellow is purple. So let's see what happens when we put purple in this. It should begin to get kind of a brown or even a gray or black color. We can get some neutrals going through this and then we can play with it in terms of whatever design we want. But we, we can get a neutral by putting the opposite of the main color uh, uh, across those three. For this one, the blue is the main color, so the opposite of blue on the color wheel is orange. So let's see what, I just rinse my brush. Let's see what happens if I put orange on here. And again, we're getting sort of a brownish color. It's a little orangey, but sort of a brownish neutral color. And here, the opposite of red is green. And you can follow along and do this. There actually are two greens on my palette, so I can play with both of them. But this one's sort of uh, almost a black. And this is the same. So again, to get some interesting effects by using the neutral along with the, the primary colors and the ones next to it. So we're going to play with this. We're going to do what's called a wet into wet exercise. And the way that we do it is it's pretty simple. We get the, the, the flat brush. This is a three quarter inch flat brush. You can use a one inch flat brush if you prefer or you can use even a bigger one, but we're gonna put water all over the paper fairly quickly until we can see that it's shiny all over. If there's some places that aren't shiny, that means they haven't gotten water yet. So we put water on, and then we're gonna just drop a primary color. Let's start with the, the one we did on the top. I'm gonna to put some yellow on here, And again, because there's water on the paper, it'll all move around. There's no right or wrong way to do this, which makes it fun. You don't have to be perfect. Can't be perfect in well, anyway. So then I'm going to rinse my brush and I'm gonna put in some orange because orange and green are, the, are on the other sides of the yellow. And we're gonna get some yellow orange. And I'm gonna put some green in. I'm gonna go ahead and use the, the one that's a little bit darker green here. But I'm still getting kind of a yellow green. And we can drip onto the paper towel. Paper towels are really good for dripping. And then we're going to play with the purple. Now if those were dry, this is wet, so let's see how it, how it differs, if it differs. Ah, can you see that some of it is getting kind of brownish? 
grayish. We can get some, some fun neutrals in there. And then of course you can do with it whatever you want, but I just wanted to have you experience the idea of things mixing together that are close on the color wheel and then seeing what happens if you go across the color wheel. But then, since we tend to, to want to play with these things and turn them into greeting cards after we're done, you can put on any color that you want just to make it fun. Once you've had the experience of getting to neutral. So have fun playing with it. Hi, I'm Ronnie again, and I'm going to walk you through this painting. But it, we're not going to get to this point, as I said before. We're going to start with this. This is a very simple lesson on sky, mountains with snow, a meadow, the beach, and water. Okay? What you're going to need to do this painting is your wonderful little watercolor paper, a nail, a birthday candle, regular table salt, but my hand has been in this a lot so I keep it not at the table, and a water spray gun. And then of course your palette. My palette is a lot different than Nancy's. Uh, just because it is, and mine has lots of colors. This is probably only three colors though, the red, the blue, and the yellow. And they're just mixed up and come out. When you mix all three colors together, they're very harmonious. That you have, you know, you got the yellow mixed with the blue, creates the green. And then the crab, little creepy crab there, he's straight up red. But I put some blue underneath mixed with red for the purple shadow. And we'll get back to him, but I'll show you how to do a crab at the end. Um, very quickly, we're going to start with the sky. So, you got your clean water. You got a Kleenex. Kleenex is nice and soft and floofy. And this is going to make your clouds soft and floofy. So, what I will do now is mix up some blue. Ooh, I'm forgetting the most important part, your candle. With your candle, you're going to mark your paper. I put pencil lines here so you can actually see where I'm putting the candle. So right now I'm going to put a candle line of wax right through here. And one on each of these lines. This is a resist. The paint watercolor will not stick to wax. And that's how we got the snow on the mountains and stuff in this one. So one more. And then you can just have fun on this white piece of paper by, I'm going to throw in, my sky is not done with the crayon. The mountains are, so I'm gonna consider invisible snow here and figure out where my mountains are and just kind of draw in some floofy little bits there. And then in the corner, I save a funny little bird shape, just an odd V, okay? So that goes right about there. Just a strange little V. And then in the grass, nothing with a candle. You're going clear to the bottom and put in some little wave action here in your water. I guess the blue candle is going to let you show where I have the wax. So that is done. You can't even see what I've done, have you? Hmm. Alrighty, up to the sky. This is a wet in wet method. And you're only going to get this top layer wet with your clean water. You don't want it too soggy, but wet enough. Watercolor follows the water. And that means, I'll use my messy one here. If I put blue in a spot here, nice and dark, it's going to stick there on the dry paper. But when I add water underneath, I can sneak up on this and make it go, wow, which is really fun. Or I can also, like Nancy said, bring it down to just clean, soft edges, okay? This was supposed to be a horse. It didn't work. Put that on my white paper towel. All righty. Now that we got this all blue, or <laughs> ready to go, here comes my blue. And I'm gonna use a lot of pigment here. Watercolor always dries lighter than what you see on the paper. But as you can see here, it is moving where I have the water. So I can move this all over. 
if I want. And that brings a very smooth sky to your painting. If you go back in with your brush, you're gonna get brush strokes galore and it's gonna look um, lumpy. So. All right, here come your clouds. My blue isn't moving fast enough. Get your Kleenex. This is a fun part of it. I learned this from Joel Popadix. He's an amazing artist in Florida that came to Lake Tahoe and did a weekend workshop some years ago and I had the pleasure of painting with him at Tahoe. So, Joel's clouds, here we go. Little mess and then you roll your squishy Kleenex through the blue. Instant clouds. And when that dries, it'll be very pretty. It's pretty now. Alrighty, moving on. Down to the water, since it's blue too, we will do it down here and I will show you how the resist is going to leave the waves in the water. Same thing, the wet and wet method. So wet paint on wet paper. That's why we call it wet and wet. And I think I'm gonna mix a couple colors in here too, just to make this not quite the same blue as the sky. So that is all wet. And we'll go with our blues again, here. And a different blue. Now you can really see where the wax, oh, <laughs> oh dear. The watermark on my paper is showing up quite a lot here too. So let's do a little fun green in here, just for fun. I'll throw that in. Yep, you can tell what paper I'm using. Okay. And like I did before, I just lift my paper and let the colors talk to each other instead of me forcing them into places where they want to go. I let them do it. And it's not quite into the corner there. Feel free to use your fingers in your painting. I do it a lot. Alrighty. We'll let that dry and the sky dry. And while we're doing that, we'll move to the meadow. Am I going too fast for anybody? <laughs> Here we go. The meadow is where you're going to need your nail or other sharp object if you're children. Make sure mom's there or dad's there or your big sister or brother because these are real nails. And lots of blue and yellow. I'll just use that one again. To create the green. And I'm not going to use that same green I used down below. When I do it in sections like this, you don't bump into the wet paint on either side of it, which can sometimes cause mistakes, but we like mistakes in watercolor. When the watercolor does its own thing and it looks like it's a mistake, step back and let it dry because often your mistakes are the best things that have happened in that painting. That's happened to me. So, all right, we're making grass here. I'm gonna use the blue. Wee. Now you can see I'm only using a few colors. Like a really good painting only has three to five colors in it. And everything else is just mixed. I don't know what's going on there. Wee. And a yellow. Another primary color. Blue and yellow make green. Okay. Add a little more blue to this. I want it to dry a little darker. All right. Now, while this is good and soupy, same technique. And this is also helping my beach kind of move around, or the water down here moving around. The ocean. So with a nail, I'm gonna create grass. And I don't know if you can see it in this one. Not from there, I'm sure, but there are little grasses in my meadow. And that's done with the nail and the paint. And you just, Grab your nail and scratch the paper with it in all different directions. Don't go matchy-matchy like railroad ties. Okay, you build some bushes. What this will do is your paint, especially the blue, will soak into these slashes that I'm making. Matchy-matchy. And create bushes. And I've made a little bit of a mess on your table. We'll fix that. 
Okay, so there's the meadow started. Now, as you can see from the one that's already dry, bland, right? Can't really see it. So I'll move to it, and I'm going to show you some negative painting. Negative painting is how I did, uh, I don't know if you can see it. In the areas around the grass is here. It dried kind of light. So I'll just bump it up with some extra pigment and show you. Ooh. Let's go dark. Pretty dark. All right, lots of color. All right, in my meadow, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna tell you what this masking tape is for too on the outsides of my painting. I'm making little shapes around my grasses. I'll throw some blue down there for shadow. And around here, up in here, and to the edge. So now it looks silly, doesn't it? What we're gonna do is clean water and I'm gonna pull all of that back to the very edge. Let me put some in here. And then add a few more shadows at the bottom of my meadow. Blue makes a beautiful shadow, especially when it mixes with different colors. Blues, purples. Okay, so this is called negative painting. It's circling in around a lighter spot of your painting and making the lighter spot more visible. And that's a big trick watercolorists use to make your painting sing. So, and that's what we want is a painting that looks really fun with some activity, things going on, and sunlight. It's all about values, light and shadow. If you wanna go really dark with something, that makes the thing next to it look really light. So, see how this is drying? Oh, good, you can see the grasses showing up here now too. So, put that back now, you can see where it's at. Okay, so, um, more about values, my not quite finished painting. I did some shapes here to look like boulder rock things on the beach and I put the crab in because he was fun. So I'm gonna put some more rock shape in so you can see that those are actually rocks. And I'm gonna use some very odd colors here that I used last night. It's purple and pink and green, and I just let it do its thing. So now more negative painting, picking out the backs of some of these rocks so I know where they're at. You gotta figure out, yeah, that's the back of a rock. And just paint around them. And that gives them more shadow and more depth. So they actually do look like rocks. And that blue is way too dark. Oh well. I'll go over here with this one. Give him some shadows too. Now like I say, watercolor does dry lighter than what you're seeing here. So this could be where it all goes south on me. We'll see. Whee. All right, I will let that dry on that one. Don't think I'm doing any more on that, so we'll see. Back to our critter we're working on. What do you think? Should we do the salt thing now? That is so much fun. Kids really like this one. We're gonna go for the beach sand, and you can see the texture that was left on here from salt. I painted over it a few times on this one. So if you actually look at this close, you'll see it sparkles because there's so much salt in there but I like it. So, same thing, same wet and wet process. Now salt is an interesting chemical with watercolors and I have found it works best with blues. So using a blue and a green just like we've done here before and when that's going, oh, hi, that's not quite blue, is it? There we go. <laughs> Let's use the same blues I was using. This will be very blue painting to start with. You see how fun the wax 
works with the paint, it gives you a fun little texture too. Okay, get that nice and wet there. Move it around. I don't need to worry about brush strokes here because the salt is gonna make all of that disappear. So, I think it's too wet right now for the salt. So, it has to have a certain sheen on your paper before, if it's too wet, the salt just goes to mush and doesn't do anything. Otherwise it has this really neat reaction with the watercolor. What I think I will do is add some pretty colors in here on my ah, meadow. I have a lovely quinacridone gold that is really quite a fun color. And it just adds prettiness to some things. And when you look at this one again, here he comes, up in the middle, there are bits of salt in this one, up in here, and more so. This is what I painted around in here. If you saw it really closely, kind of looks like dandelions in the background, quite a ways away. We also use, um, I could actually do the same effect with my squirt bottle, but everything else is wet. So let's go here. <laughs> You see how those little dots form? That's what the salt's going to do. Since my paper's too wet. Yay. Hmm. Let's see. We'll let that dry a little bit. What do you think? <laughs> Hi, welcome back. Well, my ocean sand is drying more. I'm going to actually show you some of my sketchbook here. It's not really a sketchbook, it's where I try out new paints when I get them. Like I just won three colors, a blue, a red, and a yellow. Only it's kind of a pink and a gold and how they work together. So I played with that and it's another whole palette that I tried out the paints and I, I write their colors down. What color I was using and who it was made by. This is Mission Gold Paints and what the names of the paints are. This is very handy because a burnt sienna in mission gold is completely different than the burnt sienna like Daniel Smith. And he's here too. Oh, there he is. So you look at that one and you look at the other one and they're completely different colors. People don't notice that I mean, until you start a painting and you pull out a different company's product and it's a completely different yellow. It may have the same name, but it's not the same. So here's where I tried out some watercolor ground. It's silver and you can't really see it, but it's fun to play with. And that one must be stuck, but it keeps coming up. Yeah, so this is a fun thing to do with your colors. Try them out. Here's where I was trying to do flesh tones to paint a person's face. And this is quite some time ago. Now I have this one down. I know how to do that. So, but I was messing around with colors to see which one came out the best for what I needed. And, ooh, scary. That one too. Okay, so this is a really great tool that I use quite often. Like with the pit bull painting I had up earlier, I needed to know how to make a tennis ball green. And so I went through all my greens and blues and yellows and finally came up with the perfect tennis ball green. So it was fun. I think we're ready to go with the salt here in the beach. Oh, you know what? I think I'll add some pink in here just to make it less blue sand. Okay, so this is gonna be fun. <laughs> That's my way of saying eek. Don't try this at home. There we go. That's more of a sand color. And that should work well with the salt. So, here we go. Oh, you can see it happening already. <laughs> Looks like little fleas coming up out of the sand, doesn't it? Scary. All right, I think that's gonna draw like fun. Okay, so let's do some mountains. And because I can, mm, I won't though. I was gonna paint it upside down. I won't, since you're there. 
right, my mountains, when you're painting things that are far, far away, the one color that goes away is yellow. So the further back you go in the distance, if you're looking out and studying the landscape, things up close to you have a lot of yellow in them. They're bright and sunny and cheerful and warm, the warm colors Nancy was talking about. When you get further and further and further away, the mountains turn purple and then very soft and a light blue purple sometimes. So depending on how far your mountains are back, the, the color you want to use for them. So, oh no, we're not going to use that. Ooh. I'll use purple, a little, okay, this is purple with a little orange which is complementary colors, like Nancy said. And that should thin this purple out into a lovely, soft, not quite so purple, purple. Although it is quite purpley. And I'm trying to find where my crayon is here. I think I've found it for the tops of my mountain. Okay, so now you can see it's kind of showing a little snow melty mountain top. Now when you're painting mountains, they're not all pointy pointy. Mountains have soft tops unless they're volcanic or brand new right after a great big earthquake that levels Los Angeles. Mountains are nice and soft. Little rough things. They don't go wee. That's not a mountain, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> That's a, I don't know what that is, a tent? So, a lesson on um, drawing, or just thinking about what you see. When you think about what you see, the uh, you know, mountains are soft, clouds are fluffy, grasses are pointy. Uh, Tom Lynch says to not try painting a mountain. You're not painting a mountain. You're painting soft and gray. When you look at trees, it's not a tree. It's crunchy and pokey and thick, and this is what you want to convey in your painting. So it's kind of fun to think the way he thinks. It's just, you don't call it an eyeball. It's this shape, and look at that little pretty gleam of light in there. So, get that down. Whee. And I'll put my sky in in the background. I really liked this color here. So I may use that for the sky and make it look kind of like there's a storm brewing in the background here. Where's that green again? There we go. Oh, there's my bird. Found the bird. He's over here. Okay. Now, since I got up into the sky here, I'm gonna use my clean water and make this nice and soft up in here under these clouds. Make the clouds look stormy up on top. Okay. And that brings a little harmony to the two layers of paint. Oh, look what our salt is doing here. This is very pretty. That's gonna be pretty sand. Water is dry now. I'm gonna add a little more blue. Make it look deeper in spots. And really make that Kilimanjaro paper name stand out. <laughs> Oops. When you're painting water, Unless it's waves that kind of have a little action going. Most water is painted horizontally. A quick lesson on water. If you're painting water, water flows this way. So like if this is the top of your creek and it's flowing down the hill. Okay. That's going off the page there. And then if you want, if you have a reflection that you want to show, like a tree in the background, you get your green back out again. Oof. Start up here with your tree, and then just pull it down through the water a little bit. And I'm gonna let that go side to side because your reflections on running water are never perfect. They just are reflections of what's going on up above, so. Okay, quick water lesson. Wee. Back to my clouds. A little bit about the masking tape and paper. 
since I've got you here. This I paint with 300 pound paper. It's very sturdy. What you'll probably get is like 140 pound paper and it's flabby and if you get it super wet like these are, it'll buckle and be warpy and all your paint will sink into these holes and be weird. So what you wanna do is take masking tape all the way around it like this and tape it to like a piece of foam core board like you use for science projects and stuff. And that will hold your paper down nice and flat while it gets all wet. So, and at the very end, when you're done painting, you can do this fun reveal thing. As you see all the paint on the sides, it makes it look very messy. Just get one off. And then you just pull off your masking tape and you get these really pretty nice clean white borders. Okay. Ah. That gives you space to frame too as well. Uh, what are we doing over there? Really like what the salt is doing here. But I'm going to show you more. Put something in front of my mountains here to go with the meadow. Okay, but because they're further away now, there's gonna be less yellow. And kind of a Blabby blue. So they're not so bright as these bushes down here. So I'm going to put bushes in here. They're close to. I'm going to go around my little mountain word. Bye bye, mountain word. Okay. It is very Bob Rossi. <laughs> Happy trees way far, far away. And if it's Gardnerville, we could put a cow in there real quick. Now remember I talked about shapes for eyes and stuff. You're not painting an eye, you're painting a shape. Okay, we're gonna paint a cow. He's itty bitty and he's far, far away. So square head, square body, couple of legs. I may want to use a smaller brush with him. <laughs> he looks like pie. <laughs> My cow. I don't like you cow, bye bye. You can become a bush. There. Oh my god. It's a happy accident. Alright. We got sand. Do we want boulders? Just like in the other one. I'll put some boulders in here. And again, they're just shapes. Kind of make them rocky shaped. And twirl your brush around. Get different. Make your brush do the work. The brush on the paint. You don't have to do the work. Okay. Boop. There. We'll let those dry. And those will be boulders. I think I will throw in a few flowers in my meadow here. Ah. Okay, this paint was still slightly damp around it, so you see the pink is spreading a little bit. That's going to give it a very soft edge which is fine. That's something that happens. You just walk away, don't mess with it. Let it dry on its own and see what happens. Okay. Now we'll put a crab in. I'll switch to a smaller brush. And I'll give you a crab and then we'll be done. And we'll see how that salt does right at the very end. All right. So one crabby crab coming out. Little round body little legs up front because he's really angry and then the legs at the sides and a couple of stalks for his eyes and when he dries we just use a little pen and put two little dark spots at the top but right now he looks like he's floating so I am going to give him a shadow and stick him to the ground Crabby has a shadow. Move that into the boulder. And you see how his color is actually moving into the shadows too. So. Okay, hope you can see that all. I think we're good here. Okay, so I think we're pretty much done here. Um, at least with this lesson. I do teach at the Nevada Museum of Art when they're open again. And I do have classes at TMCC once in a while. But I'm around town.
You can track me down through the Sierra Watercolor Society. <laughs>